My mother told me to go to the hospital. The mother that my husband calls meat cleaver and not June cleaver. <laughs> she would say things like, I never wanted any of you kids. Or say, it's all your fault when I was 12 that my brother got hit by a car. She was not the kind of person you would go to to make you feel better. So why did I call my mother? I had left at 16. I was 21 in Israel on my junior year abroad. She was in Indiana. I had rarely spoken to her since leaving home. Yet, I called her at work at her nursing home, putting in all the digits of the phone card. Hi, Mom. I really have to get back to my patients. What is it? Suddenly, all words left me. The cord of the telephone hung like bric-a-brac. I looked at my hands. No time, no place. Anna? Anna? I snapped out of my dream. I stuttered, I don't, I don't. What are you trying to say? I don't go to the hospital. Get to it. Now, my mother knew me. She knew that if I had a goal, if I had a mission, I would get it done. I would put everything else aside and persist until I achieved it. But here's the thing. I didn't know how to get to the hospital. It wasn't as if you could just call 911. I needed to go out into the lobby and talk to people. How was I going to do that if I couldn't speak? I had to. She had told me to. I pulled on my red thermals. It was cold. I put on my oversized blue running shorts, my Rehov Sum Sum t-shirt with Bert and Ernie smiling out at everybody, and my gray jacket. I started with my dorm mother. Hospital, I can't feel my, what was this thing? I pointed at it. Oh, that's not so bad. Just take an aspirin. You'll feel better in the morning. I tried to motion to her. My by now dragging leg, but she was talking to somebody else. Mission, hospital. This was more than aspirin could solve. I went and knocked on my friend's door. She wasn't there. It was between semesters. People were packing, leaving for home. I went down the stairs to another person who was on the program. The stench of feral cat piss was overwhelming. <sighs> and after what felt like a very long time knocking, Owen came to the door, finally. What? He had the red eyes of someone who had just smoked pot. Hospit. I pointed at my dragging leg, motioned that I couldn't feel my arm pointed out my bloody, bloody knuckles from pounding at his door. One minute. He brought back a stone made of hematite. <laughs> Gave it to me with the instructions to rub it up and down my arm and leg. I went up the stairs into my room and tried. The hematite looked like silver snaking up and down my arm. I wanted to lie in the warm patch by the window. I wanted to swallow that oyster full of light. But no, mission, hospital. I went into the lobby. I tried pointing to my arm, tried to point my, to my dragging leg, to anyone who could see. Hosp, ha, ha. Finally, Jennifer, my next room over neighbor, recognized what was happening. 
I still don't know her last name. But I found out later that she was a neurology student packing to go back home to continue her degree. Huh. She looked at me. I showed her my dragging leg, motioned that I couldn't feel my arm. Wait a minute. Smile for me. I attempted, but only half of my face responded. Oh, wow. Wha what? We've got to get you to the hospital. She paid for our cab fare, stay with me until I was seen by the ER doctor. Mission achieved. <laughs> uh, Mount Carmel Hospital's emergency room report, January 6, 1996, for the treating physician. She complaint and emergency room findings. Anna Avraham, patient age 21, arrived to emergency with weakness on the right side and speech problems. Upon examination, the patient is conscious, sleepy, and able to perform orders partially. At 3.20, her situation gradually worsened. She started to have grand mal seizures. The patient received oxygen, 10 milligrams Valium IV, and the seizure stopped. At 3.50, the patient transferred to neurosurgery intensive care department and in severe condition, restless with seizures on the face and right arm and leg. It is thought intracerebral hemorrhage. In a coma, you're touching an electric fence. Irritable is a medical term for seizure. You are electric, floating in the pool, all barriers dissolved. I became my father's hand, his voice, musical, husky with fear, pulling me, he wept for his electric daughter. When I wake up from my coma, I can't move my right side. I could do nothing but cry and laugh. Even if nothing's sad or funny, I was 21, my mom is there, my dad is there in Israel. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my mom says that she had held my hand while I was in the coma. Did you feel it? She asked me. I nod, but really, I didn't feel shit. <laughs> My dad weeps, thanking God. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. He does a little dance, raises his arms. I go to sleep. When my friend comes to visit, she makes me cry and laugh so hard that I wet the bed. I cry when my handsome Israeli boyfriend takes off his motorcycle helmet, leans over my bed, and whispers, you look like an angel. Take out your IV. I want to fuck. <laughs> and cry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and cry again. S some people, I like that, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I cry when mom says, what a hunk, and how she liked to run his, her fingers through his curls. I cry when she spoons feeds me soft boiled egg, say ah, and tries to help me shower. I cry when the young man with staples in his head, mute as I am, steps into my room and stares and stares. The medical instructor and his students whisked into my room without knocking, and before I can object, they are all looking at me. They are here to learn. I begin to cry. Emotional lability, the medical instructor says. 
pursuant to stroke. The students scribble furiously. I cry and cry. In the post-acute care unit of Mount Carmel Hospital in Haifa, Israel, I share a room with a man who has numbers tattooed on his arm. Cancer, he says, Sardon, and points to his head, his hand, his head, yeah. He's unlikely to survive, or so the doctor's hushed voices tell me as I pass in and out of sleep. My limited Hebrew consists of ani medeberet kutsat ivrit, and not even that now. I can't speak English without a stutter. I'm just coming to, and my father is reading this man, Isaiah 53. A prophecy that my dad thinks foretells Jesus. Dad is always saying that he would bring the truth by any means necessary. But proselytizing is strongly discouraged in Israel. And anyway, it's just in poor taste to witness to a person who can't answer. <laughs> I wave my arm, say mm, to dad to stop. A look passes between me and the man. We sigh at the same moment. He rubs his eyes, pushes fingers to his lips, rolls over. I am furious with my dad. Come on, honey, turn that frown upside down. <laughs> I grunt in disgust and turn my back to him. When I can speak about two weeks after my stroke, I tell my parents to go home. I still talk with a stutter. I can move without an obvious limp. When the nurses said I could walk, I ran. Every day, I walk stairs and do something to get better, to get faster, to get to where I had been, to what I had been doing. Go, go home. What, what, what you do here? So you want me to make like a tree and leave? My father asks. <laughs> uh-huh, I nod. Okay, that's really what you want me to do. He's on the next flight out of air. <laughs> My mom is a different matter. She wants to stay longer. I have to deploy a different tactic. You, you, ne never be in is a a again. I tell her that it's highly unlikely that she'll ever come back to Israel. I tell her to tour or else she'll regret it. With a lot of hemming and hawing on her part, she left. <laughs> Just to go to Jerusalem to see my old friend Ruth I smile, inwardly breathing a huge sigh of relief. My mom tends to make everything about her, about her sacrifice and her rescuing me, and it's exhausting, particularly in my present state. Have fun. <laughs> they keep me into the hospital for about a month. After that, I am free to go. I am taking Coumadin, a blood thinner. I have to have my blood tech every four weeks for all my life after. I have antiphospholipid syndrome, a disease of coagulation. My blood is thick and forms clots easily. One of these clots had gone to my brain and caused a massive stroke. When I go back to my dorm, I try to give the hematite back to Owen, but he would not take it back. Imagine that. <laughs> you can keep it. I am finding out all sorts of things that I cannot do now. Typing. 
holding my pee. <laughs> of course, talking without a stutter. I have aphasia, the tip of my tongue disease. I learn to talk around it. Say, that thing that you sit on when I can't say chair. I stay in the study abroad program, taking, I think, women in the Bible, Hebrew, Jewish Christian relations. I didn't know how I passed. I probably, no. I lack the capacity to think in any kind of logical manner. Learned again to type. Did kegels so that I could hold my pee more. <laughs> I had never been a big talker, more a thinker. Before, I was anxious about what people would think of me, if they knew what kind of ideas were in my head. Now, there were no ideas in my head. I had attained enlightenment. <laughs> Before, I was a runner. Now, I become witness after a walk, walking up a hill. I. I'm afraid to sleep, thinking that I would go into a coma again. But every morning when I wake up, I am vibrantly alive, willing to do whatever. And by whatever, I mean whatever. <laughs> when I search in the mountains of Haifa for a dress, I end up with this short little number in silver. It will match my silver chunky 90s heels. <laughs> My friends all wear normal clothes to dance in, black shirts, somber dresses. I shine like a glitter bomb. <laughs> and if I cannot think in any logical manner, I can move my butt. <laughs> I figured that if I could survive a stroke, I could survive anything. So I go to Dahab, Egypt with a guy who had just been dancing with me. <laughs> Get high with hashish, destroying more of my brain cells. <laughs> I hallucinate. I see the meaning of life in a tetrahedron. I do not want to be a passive observer timid and scared all the time. I snorkel in the Red Sea and see all of the beautiful yellow and indigo fish. I dance, spinning my handkerchief with the Egyptians. My prefrontal lobe tries to pull itself together, but I, an invincible 21-year-old, think death cannot harm me. What is left of my healthy neurons? Shoot out sprouts of connection, astrocytes to repair the damage incurred by the clot, cutting off oxygen to my translator. Miraculous the way the world looks to me now a kind of burning, a kind of, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, and the way my clogs clacked on this stone walkways, or how the walls of the old city felt womb-like, and how the light struck differently, older and more golden, on the veranda of Ruth Bornstein's house overlooking where the Palestinians had thrown rocks and Israelis had fired guns. I ate tart tangerines with yogurt and granola and milk out of a bag, sipped Wasatsky mint tea through sugar cubes and ate warm lavash bread with Lebanon cheese and zahtar spice that goat herders had got, brought up from the hills of Haifa. I wanted to try everything to taste and see, oh, taste and see that it's good. 
when I returned to the States. After learning to walk, type, hold my pee, <laughs> and sleep, I had an Israeli ac accent because I had learned English again in Israel. Neuroplasticity is the concept that the brain heals itself. It was thought that once brain cells were dead, that that was it. However, neurons continue to seek out connections even after and sometimes because of serious damage. Half of my brain was black on the MRI. Yet, maybe you would never know that I had had a stroke unless I had told you like I'm telling you now. Anna Gassaway, ladies and gentlemen, Anna.